निरेंद्र स्टार्ट कर दो Good afternoon, everyone. Today we are going to have a webinar. It's a two-day webinar on CC 5.1, that is International Economics, under the CBCS curriculum of Economics Honors of Calcutta University. Our very renowned speaker, Professor Koushik Gupta, he will be delivering lecture on both these days. You can view. You can see that. Within three to four minutes, the entire hundred participants have joined in Google Meet, and others have joined in YouTube as well. So, we are very much thankful to Professor Gupta for agreeing to our request. Every now and then, whenever we have requested him to do programs for us, he has agreed. I I know him since two thousand five to since two thousand six. Uh, he has taught me in my undergraduate. Postgraduate courses. I have done my MPhil, and I was fortunate to do my PhD under his supervision. So I welcome Professor Koshi Gupta sir. And we have with us our principal sir, Professor Dr. Tilak Chatterjee sir. I welcome him also. Last year we had organized a similar sort of program, not similar. It was guidelines for the students on CC 5.11. But this year, our principal sir had proposed to do something that will be, that will benefit the students at the beginning of their semester classes. So I asked Professor Gupta sir to do something on that, and he said he will be delivering a, a detailed lecture. That means a comprehensive discussion on few aspects of international economics. So from today and so from today. 
Till tomorrow, these two days, we will be having detailed discussion on few aspects or you can say few modules of your syllabus. Every right, every details are given in the uh, flex, you can say, or our notification. So without any delay, I would request Professor Tilak Chatterjee sir to inaugurate this webinar to and to say something. Over to you, sir. I formally declare that the webinar is on. I welcome KG sir, Kaushik Gupta sir, to this webinar. Uh, Kaushik Gupta sir is known to is known to uh, almost all students of all colleges under the Calcutta University or even in other universities as well. He requires no introduction. To me, he is an inspiration, not only to the students, but also to the teachers. His passionate involvement in extending his helping hand to the students as well as the teachers is really exemplary. I think there is network issue. Now, students, those who are here, please have your microphone in mute mode as well as turn off your camera and you can ask your friends who couldn't join here in the Google Meet. They can see the program live on YouTube and they can post their questions there as well. Pooja is present there. She will be taking those questions.
tell him to unmute he is muted nilendu tell him to unmute sir Mr. Chatterjee, you are muted. Please unmute yourself. ओके सर 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 स्टार्ट कर दो ओके सो लेट मी स्टार्ट नाउ ओके ठीक है एक्चुअली जस्ट आफ्टर अ लॉन्ग ब्रेक फॉर द स्टूडेंट्स मेनली फॉर द फिफ्थ सेमेस्टर दे विल अगेन हैव टू स्टार्ट देयर सीसी 5.11 सीसी 11 paper international economics so as there has been a long break just after your exam so you may not remember your old things it means some of the applications of microeconomics especially in the context of mathematical economics and some of the issues some of the basic concepts of microeconomics especially production function and perfect competition so i'll revise this some of some of these parts because these are very essential for international economics basically the part you have the pure theory of international trade is an application of microeconomics and you have a little part of open economy macroeconomics as well without going through the details of the syllabus the details of the syllabus i will discuss at the end after tomorrow's discussion a guideline that i'll give but before that let me have a look briefly 
at the syllabus, the main points, the main sections of the syllabus without going into the details. And then I'll start. So let me share the screen. First of all, I should thank, I should thank uh, Bonkim Shardar College, the principal of this college, and also the faculty members of the Department of Economics, especially Nilendu Chatterjee, for inviting me. This is for the third time I'm speaking here. First two years back, I spoke in an occasion in a seminar for the students in an offline mode, in offline mode, but last year in online mode, I delivered lectures for the students and this is the third occasion. So can you can you just see the screen, everybody? Just please respond. Nilindu, Yes, yes. Okay. So this is just an outline of studying international economics for semester five. If we look at the topics, the broad structure of the syllabus, one should start international trade pure theory of international trade or international economics from the topic absolute advantage and comparative advantage. Then one should focus on building blocks of trade theory, which includes community indifference curve, trade indifference curve, and also offer curves. Then there should be a discussion on gains from trade. But after this comes a very important topic, which is basically the foundation for some of the advancement of trade theory, that is production structure of neoclassical trade models, which is the micro foundation part that I shall discuss. After this, one should focus on Hicks-Chiarolin-Samuelson model. Now under Hicks-Chiarolin-Samuelson model, there are various topics, but I have just focused on COD because this is the most important one. COD means it's an abbreviation. It's cone of diversification. Then comes applications of neoclassical trade models for developing countries, which includes Jones 65 and Jones 71. Today, I shall discuss, first of all, production structure of neoclassical trade models, which is basically the micro foundation. One should know this micro foundation very well. Otherwise, they won't be able to follow this Jones 65 and 71 models. These are the new things that are included in the syllabus. In the earlier syllabus, these things were not there. So that's why I've chosen to teach these topics. But actually, for international trade, one should start from absolute advantage and comparative advantage in terms of sequence. But as these are relatively difficult for you, these topics. So I've chosen these two. And tomorrow, I shall discuss Actually, tomorrow I shall discuss Jones 71 and also a topic which is COD, which comes under strictly under Hicks-Chiarolin Samuelson model, but basically it's an application. So it also falls under application of neoclassical trade models. So Jones 71 and COD, I shall discuss tomorrow. I shall discuss production structure of neoclassical trade models, which is the micro foundation, and Jones 1965 model today. There are some other topics, trade policy and open economy, macroeconomics, and balance of payments. The earlier topics in the last page and trade policy, these are all applications of microeconomics. But open economy, macroeconomics, and balance of payments is an application of macroeconomics. So it's a mix of microeconomics and macroeconomics. Of course, applications or extensions of microeconomics and macroeconomics. So I shall start, I shall start, of course, with the discussion on this foundation's neoclassical trade model, but I shall start from a revision, just a brief revision of the old concepts. And whenever I discuss these things, earlier these things were included in the postgraduate syllabus. Now these are shifted to the undergraduate level because basically these are the things of undergraduate level. All of you know about production function. All of, all of you know about cost equation or ISO cost curve. So for a minute, I shall just stop this presentation 
and let me just share with you that can you tell me that what is the can any one of you tell me what is the distinction between a cost equation and a cost function because this is very very important i want this answer from the students can any one of you at least if you can try 50% remaining 50% i can help you any student especially from lady brabon college or bethun college or if there are students from st xavier's college anybody or from ashutosh college i'll be very happy if any one of you can answer this the difference between cost equation and a cost function so none of you can answer this so i think yes sir sir yes, yes you can try you are from which college yes sir this is somrat shadukan from bhavanipur college so yes. Uh, yes sir so the cost function is uh, the cost equation is a function of cost where uh, sorry the cost equation involves the labor and capital and when rental rate and the wage rate but cost yes. function but in cost function the cost is a function of quantity only very good very good cost is a function of output that is the difference now can you tell me the relationship between the two that is the answer can you tell me how cost equation is related to cost function But it's very good that you have answered it correctly. Yes, sir. If we minimize the cost function, uh, cost sorry, equation. Sir, cost cost equation. equation. Yes, sir. If we minimize that the is, cost the equation, we find the cost function. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Very good, sir. Okay. So let me just show it to you. So as he said. From Bhavanipur Education Society, it is correct. So consider, can you see everybody? Nilan, do you see that? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. So if we consider the production function, x is a function of labor and capital, l x and k x, and cost equation, which is the iso cost equation or iso cost function, that is the cost constraint, is given by. W L X plus R K. So all of you know this. This C equal to W L X plus R K X is called cost equation. Where a C as a function of output, which is X here, it can be Q, as we usually write, is the cost function. So whenever whenever we write marginal cost, it is the first derivative of C with respect to output. So we derive marginal cost from the cost function, not from the cost equation. the question is how cost function is related to cost equation cost function is actually the minimized cost equation so for this we minimize cost subject to the output constraint now when we minimize cost subject to the output constraint if you just have a look at this page you will find the first order conditions from the first order conditions we find that basically we can obtain three equations from which we can solve for three unknowns and these unknowns are lx kx and mu so the optimal value of lx is lx star optimum value of kx is kx star and optimum value of mu is mu star and these are functions of factor prices which are the parameters here and also the level of output you can fix output at different levels you can fix output at different levels so naturally lx will change for that so whenever we do this exercise we fix output at a level but basically what we can derive here is lx star kx star and mu star these are functions of factor prices and the level of output we check the second order condition and we observe that it is it's minimized this cost equation is minimized so we put the optimal values of lx and kx replace them by lx star and kx star So, if we put the optimal values of Lx star, Lx and Kx as Lx star and Kx star, we ultimately find cost as a function of x, w, and r. Remember, w and r are parameters, so we get c as a function of x as the cost function. So, what we get here is the minimized cost equation, which is the cost function. And for drawing your marginal cost curve or average cost curve, 
what we need we need c as a function of x not c equal to w l plus r k or not c equal to w l x plus r k x so this is the difference i hope that this is clear to everybody now what we'll do here throughout this neoclassical trait theory it has been assumed that production function exists ex exhibits constant returns to scale now this is the traditional trait theory the krugman has developed this theory i mean he has considered increasing returns to scale which is known as new trait theory which is not a part of your course these things are covered at the post graduate level so for throughout your syllabus we assume that there exists constant returns to scale so whenever there exists constant returns to scale it has some speciality it means that if we increase labor by lambda times kx by lambda times output will also increase by lambda times now without loss of generality if we consider lambda to be 1 by x now you can ask me why i shall consider lambda to be equal to 1 by x i can consider lambda to be equal to 1 by lx yes you can do that but that will not serve your purpose so you can take any positive quantity to be equal to lambda so without loss of generality let me consider lambda be equal to 1 by x where x is positive if i write that i can interpret it on the left hand side lambda times x becomes 1 because lambda is now 1 by x and on the right hand side we have f of lx by x kx by x now what about this lx by x lx by x means actually just follow this interpretation to produce x units how much labor is required lx to produce one unit labor required is lx by x this is known as alx so alx is the amount of labor required to produce one unit of output similarly akx is the amount of capital required to produce one unit of output so this alx and akx are known as the labor coefficient or the capital coefficient sometimes we call them as input output coefficients as well so these are the labor and the capital coefficients and we denote them by alx and kx so in this case earlier cost equation was wlx plus rkx why because the production function was like this x equal to function of lx kx but now the production function is a function of alx and akx and on the output side the output is 1 so we replace we replace lx by alx kx by akx so c dash is your cost equation because the inputs have changed they are now converted to alx and akx so it shows the cost equation to produce one unit of output now whenever we write in this way we know that in general the cost function is x semicolon w comma r but if you convert your output to one c becomes actually a function of only w and r this we need for our discussion i hope that is it's okay to everybody if there is any question up to this you can ask me please feel free to ask me because these are foundations if you want to repeat something you can ask me is it okay yes sir yes sir okay okay now again i shall consider some revision of old concepts now again i'll just stop sharing the slide and i would like to have a discussion so just tell me under perfect competition i'll be very happy if any one of you can answer so uh, under perfect competition what is the equilibrium condition can any one of you tell me it's very simple question just a simple mr equals to mc is equal to yes 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 just just a is equal to mc yes mr is equal to price here yeah? so price equal to mc that's what you are saying yeah yes, just sir. will the firms enjoy equal to mc okay will the firms firms enjoy profit no sir it's not no, profit in long run no no in the long run but as you have said price is equal to mc so firms will either enjoy super normal profit or loss isn't it so what will happen as a result of that there will be free entry and exit of firms isn't it 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. well, at first, okay. uh, the farms will have a, a, a positive profit. You can't say. It can't, it can't say. There can be loss as well. Yeah, uh, also there can be So, loss. there will be free entry and exit of firms as a result of this. So, as a result of free entry and exit of firms, what will happen ultimately? So, ultimately, uh, profits will boil down to zero. Yeah, at first, uh, no, no profit. Profit, then seeing this profit, some uh, new firms will enter the... So, there will be free entry and exit. That's what I have said. So, yeah. ultimately, profits are boiled down to zero. So when profits are boiled down to zero, so please don't send chats because I uh, just if you can reply, then only you can reply. But don't send chats. So uh, profits are boiled down to zero. Profits are boiled down to zero means, of course, it's normal profit. Yeah. Profits are boiled down to zero means what? What is the condition then? you know that Shantani answered correctly. Just you can just think a little bit and can answer this. When profit is equal to zero, price is equal to what? So price is equal to uh, MC, there is marginal cost. No, no, no. That's the condition. That's the basic condition that you have said. But uh, when price is equal to MC, you can't predict whether profits are positive or ne negative. But ultimately, ultimately means what in the long run, isn't it? So ultimately in the long run, that is free and free price and is equal to AC. Yes. So what AC, is the right price is equal to AC average cost? Is it AC or long run AC? Long run AC. Yes, that's right. Long run AC. Please mute now. Kushi Kothari, as you said, that price is equal to price is equal to AC. So do you agree that its price is equal to long run AC? LAC? Yes. Price is yes, equal sir. to long. Price yes. is equal to long run AC. It's also equal to short run AC. Now, what about this short run and long run? Because we have read growth theory. You had growth theory in the earlier semester, isn't it? You had solo yes. model? Yes, sir. Isn't it? There, you, you were already familiar with the concept of steady state, isn't it? The yes, capital, sir. labor, uh, then uh, consumption, income all grow at the same rate. That steady state is also a long run, but there we have dynamics. We have differential equation or difference equation, mainly differential equation. What you know that it's L dot by L, or K dot by K. But here we have no dynamics. This is long run. That is also long run. So how can you reconcile between the two? So in the short run, point. there will be uh, some variable factors and other factors will remain fixed. But, but my point is different. In perfect competition, we say long run. But in perfect competition, we don't use any dynamics. We use dynamics, no? There is no equation of motion there. Whereas in solar model, we also say long run, but there we use equation of motion, isn't it? When we say something about growth, we use equation of motion there. So how do you reconcile? In one long run, you, can, you are saying something in terms of equations of motion, but in one long run, you are saying something in terms of only static model. So, either you are wrong, or the authors are wrong, or you'll have to reconcile between the two. You got my question, Adarsha? Uh, yes, sir. So, that never just, you didn't have any query like this at when you were taught these things, that both are long run, but what's in what sense it's long run? Remember, this long run under perfect competition is Marshallian long run. It is Marshallian long run. Marshall divided his analysis for his convenience to develop this perfect competition idea into short run, long run, or more specifically, very short period, short period, long period, very long period. But basically, short period and very short period combines together and we call it short run. And Long period and very long period combines together and we call it long run. That Marshallian long run is different from the long run that we ref refer to in the context of economic growth. That is different from the long run, usual long run in economics. So this long run average cost is the Marshallian long run average cost. It's not a dynamic one. 
Marshallian long run is not a dynamic one. It shows a transition from a period of profit and what happens after entry and exit of firms, profits are converted to normal profits. You got my point, everybody? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, what I'm saying is that the usual long run that we know in economics, in growth economics, is different from the long run in perfect competition because in perfect competition there is no equation of motion there is no equation differential equation with respect to time we call it equation of motion perfect competition is a static model it's marshallian long run marshall referred to it as long run and he classified the behavior of firms into different phases very short period short period very long period very long period very short period, short period constitutes short run. Very long period, long period constitutes long run. So the long run in Marshallian, from the usual long run that we find in solo model, because in perfect competition, there is no dynamics. So it's just a phase movement from one phase from other. It's just a movement of phases. So in one phase, there is profit or loss as a result of which free and fear exit a firm firms and after that we have a situation of long run where there is zero profit now is it okay okay sir. yes sir yes sir okay, so that's what is written here Price is equal to long run average cost. That means it is the zero profit condition. Now, in real life, can there be zero profit? That's what I'll ask, but not now. I'll discuss this in the context of the trade models. Next comes the envelope condition, which we frequently use in trade theory. In fact, there are questions from use of envelope condition in the context of trade models. So when we consider the envelope condition, rather the envelope theorem, we know envelope theorem implies change in the Lagrangian, Lagrangian expression as a result of change in any parameter, say alpha, is same as change in the maximum value function. If it is maximization of utility, then it's change in the maximum utility function. That means the indirect utility function subject to the change in the same parameter. If it is minimization of cost, we call it the minimum value function. So that's why we say change in the Lagrangian as a result of change in any parameter is same as the change in the maximum value or minimum value function as a result of the change of the same parameter. This is known as the envelope theorem. All of you know this. You are familiar with this because these things were there included in your mathematical economic syllabus. So this is this envelope theorem we need. We need to illustrate the trade models, I mean to get some results of that from the trade models. Another thing which we use frequently in trade model, which is Schaeffer's lemma. Actually, there is no distinction between CX and C. CX is same as C. CX is the cost function for production of commodity X. So del CX, del W, but W you can treat it as a parameter, is equal to LX. This is the statement of Schiffer's lemma. You can recall this LX is demand for labor and del CX, del W is change in cost function as a result of change in the wage rate. Had there been rate of return on capital R here, we should write here KX. So whatever you write here, the corresponding demand function comes here. Is it okay to everybody? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, just see the relationship between envelope theorem, the envelope theorem and Schiffer's lemma. So this is envelope theorem. Just look at the box. Del L, del W. Del L, del W equal to del C, del W. If you just look at this part, this W can be treated as a parameter, mainly in partial equilibrium models. It's treated as a parameter. A del C del W means del L del W means change in the Lagrangian expression as a result of change in the parameter, which is W here, the wage rate, is same as change in the cost function, which is the minimized function, minimized cost equation, 
as a result of change in the same parameter. So if you just look at this box, this is envelope theorem. And if we consider the subset of this box, just have a look at this part, it's Shepard's lemma. Is it okay now? So Shepard's lemma is same as envelope theorem. In fact, Shepard's lemma can be interpreted as envelope theorem. We get the same results. Is it okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I shall show yes, sir. after this, when I shall pass over to the micro foundations, that Shepard's lemma or this envelope theorem, whenever we do this envelope theorem, envelope theorem, all of you know, is nothing but it's it's a collection. You, you usually refer it as long run average cost curve as the tangent of short run average cost curve or collection of tangents of short run average cost curve. This is the way you know about envelope. But actually, in general, envelope means it's a collection of tangency conditions. Even in consumer behavior, we can have envelope theorem. Even in production theory, we can have envelope theorem. We can have isoquant and isocost functions, and we can have envelope theorem. So it's nothing but a collection of tangency conditions. That I shall interpret. But before this, I shall just start with the micro foundation. This is the same micro foundation that I delivered my lecture on 10th August 2020 for fifth semester last year's batch, fifth semester batch here for this college, Wankim Shardar College. This is just a summary, production structure of neoclassical trade models. Don't worry about the notes. You will, I'll circulate, I'll ask the organizers to circulate the notes. So don't worry about it. We consider the production function. Just have a look at the production function. The same production function by the time you are familiar with this production function. FLX is the marginal productivity of X, which is positive. If LXLX means marginal, it's diminishing marginal productivity. It's a second order, which is less than zero. If KX is positive, that is the marginal productivity of capital is positive. If KX, KX is less than zero, that means we have positive but diminishing marginal productivity corresponding to each fa factor. Is it okay? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. sir. We consider constant returns to scale. As I said, for neoclassical trade theory, throughout we assume constant returns to scale. As we consider constant returns to scale, we multiply lambda x by lambda, lx by lambda, and kx by lambda without loss of generality, of course, and we select lambda to be equal to 1 by x without loss of generality. So on the left-hand side, we have 1, and as I said earlier, lx by x can be written as a lx, which is the labor coefficient, and kx by x is called the capital coefficient, unit capital coefficient. That means to produce one unit of output, how much of labor is required? It's a lx. How much of capital is required? It's a kx. Now, this ALX and AKX, if they are fixed, as we find in input-output theory, we call them as fixed coefficient production function. But here, that is a Leon TF production function. But here, actually, ALX and AKX are variable. So it's a variable coefficient technology. It's not fixed coefficient technology. This is something new to you. So just LX is replaced by ALX and KX is replaced by AKX and X is replaced by 1. So these are the unit labor and capital requirements. And the corresponding isoquant, 1 equal to F ALX AKX, is known as unit isoquant, as mentioned here. It's known as unit isoquant. You got it, everybody? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And this UV line is nothing but your cost equation. What is the cost, sorry, what is the cost equation? Cost equation is given by here. This is the cost equation. You, you are already familiar with this. WALX plus RKX. Remember, even if we write it in terms of WLX plus RKX, the slope is still W by R in absolute terms. So instead of that, for one unit of output, the cost equation is WALX plus RKX. We write it as CX dashed. The slope is still W divided by R. So here, this cost equation or the isocost line is tangent to the unit isoquant at point E. And the optimal levels of ALX and AKX are given by ALX star and AKX star. Is it okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Remember, the slope yes. is W divided by R.
Suppose there is a fall in the value of W divided by R. So as you find in figure two, the slope becomes flatter. So suppose initially the equilibrium is at E1. So when there is a fall in W divided by R, the slope becomes flatter and the equilibrium, the new equilibrium is now at point E2, where it's tangent to the same unit isoquant. So what we observe here, we observe here that as a result of a fall in W divided by R, ALX increases from ALX start to ALX double start and AKX falls from AKX start to AKX double start. Is it okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So what we conclude from here, we conclude from here is that yes, ALX changes as a result of change in W divided by R or wage rental ratio. So ALX, that is this input output ratio or labor coefficient is sensitive to change in W by R. It's not fixed. It's sensitive to change in W divided by R. AKX is also sensitive to change in W divided by R. This is, this is actually implication that ALX, AKX are no more fixed. ALX will increase when W by R falls. What is the logic behind it? The logic is simple. As W by R falls, wage be, I mean wage rate of the workers is cheaper compared to the rate of return of the capitalists of capital. So W by R falls means labor becomes relatively cheaper compared to capital. So there will be more demand for labor on part of the producers. Even to produce one unit of output, if labor becomes cheaper, unit labor demand, unit labor requirement will increase. So that's why ALX will increase. So um, we start with fall in W by R, we end with increase in ALX, which shows that ALX depends on W by R. So that when W by R falls, ALX increases. Is it okay? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. When W by R falls, the opposite thing happens, that R by W increases. So capital becomes more expensive. So the demand for, the unit demand for capital falls. So that's why AKX falls from AKX start to AKX double start. So this is the economics behind it, or the logic behind it. So what we conclude here, that ALX, AKX are not fixed, it's not so, fixed. Yes? I have a doubt. Yes? Uh, sir, uh, if we have enough labor to uh, do something or do uh, one unit of uh, output, then why should we uh, demand more? Although the Because the production requires both labor and capital. Because if you have surplus labor, they will not be able to utilize the capital. So if you need more, if you have enough labor, if you have more labor, actually what you are doing here, you are substituting. There is some degree of substitutability between capital and labor. Your production process is such that if you have enough labor, that means if you demand more of labor, you will reduce your consumption of capital, consumption of capital input. Yeah. Because you substitute capital by labor. So what I'm saying here, that depends upon the degree of substitutability. Remember, in case of fixed coefficient production function, there is no substitutability. Elasticity of substitution is zero. But here, it's not fixed coefficient. Here we have elasticity of substitution positive. So we assume from the very, very beginning that labor can capital can be substituted by labor. So because labor is cheap, so you substitute, it's the input substitution effect. You substitute capital by labor. Is it okay? Okay, sir. Thank you. Let me ask you one question. That ALX is a function of W divided by R. And AKX is a function of W divided by R. You agree with this? Now, there is an alternative interpretation. You know this is the cost equation. This is the cost equation to produce one unit of output. So if you minimize cost equation, subject to the production function, of course, this unit production function, then we have a Lagrangian expression like this. Is it okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So instead yes, of ALX star, we have ALX star here. And ALX star is a function of W comma R comma output, which is one. So there is no need to write that. So ALX star is a function of W comma R, isn't it? AKX star is also a function of W comma R. 
You got my point? Of course, mu star is also a function of W comma R. But at least you can say that ALX star is a function of W comma R. AKX star is a function of W comma R. You got my point? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, is it yes. not a contradiction because here I have considered ALX, rather ALX star is a function of W divided by R. But here I am saying ALX star is a function of W comma R. How do you reconcile between these two? When I say this intuitively or using diagram, I find ALX star is a function of W divided by R. Whereas when we consider it mathematically, we find that ALX star is a function of W comma R. My point is very simple. How to reconcile? Both are correct. How to reconcile between the two? So because, uh, because whatever it is in decrease in R or increase in W, uh, both will affect the... No, no, no. That is not the point. My point is why I am not writing here W divided by R. Here I am writing W comma R in general form. Whereas there I have written W divided by R. Are these two same? So both W and R are here. But Sir, it's not written in the form of a ratio. It's written as comma. Just... Here I have written it as a ratio. Yes, sir. Both is done. Yes, both are. But how do? what is the argument? Both are true. Sir, Im implicit function. No. Don't think too much. This is a very simple example. Well, what's the why it's implicit function? It's not implicit. It's very much explicit. Uh, so if we just uh, divide, it has an economic interpretation. One property of demand function. It's a demand function, isn't it? It's input demand function. Yes. Sir. ALX star is what? ALX star is the optimal input, the optimal labor demand to produce one unit of output. AKX star is the optimal capital demand to produce one unit of output. The demand function is a very important property. All demand functions are homogeneous of degree zero in prices. So here W is price of X and O. Uh, uh, let me finish. Let me finish. Okay. Let me finish. Sorry, sorry. I'm saying, I asked you earlier. So, so these are demand functions. So all demand function is a very important property. It's homogeneous of degree zero in prices. So W and R are prices of ALX star. W is the own price of ALX. R is the cross price. So why not? If I consider this property, demand functions as homogeneous of degree zero in prices, maybe input demand function. So why not I can multiply W by lambda, I can multiply R by lambda and keep ALX star intact. Because demand function is homogeneous of degree zero means that even if you multiply W by lambda, R by lambda, ALX star will remain unchanged. Got it everybody? Yes, sir. Now, without loss of generality, you can select lambda to be equal to 1 by r. If you select lambda to be equal to 1 by r, then what is ALX star? It becomes ALX star as a function of W divided by r, comma 1. So 1 doesn't mean anything. So it's a function of W divided by r. So it doesn't matter whether we write W comma r or W divided by r because demand functions or input demand functions are homogeneous of degree zero in prices. Is it okay? Any question now in this regard? Any confusion? No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Clear. Clear. So that's why it doesn't matter. We can write in both ways. This is what is shown here. So it doesn't matter that whether it's homogeneous of, I mean, whether it's written as W comma R or W divided by R. It's the same thing. So the uni minimized cost equation is the cost function. This is the unit cost function. That means to produce one unit of output. So we write it as W is equal to ALX, W comma R, R is equal to AKX, W comma R. You can write it as ALX, W divided by R, AKX, W divided by R. It doesn't matter. So basically unit cost is a function of only factor prices and not the level of output. You got my point? Under CRS? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So actually, unit cost means basically average cost function. Unit cost means what? Remember, what is CX dashed? As I said, CX dashed is C, it's CX C by X, isn't it? It's average cost. You got my point, everybody? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Average cost is a function of factor prices under constant returns to scale. Just 
see here. Remember this long run average cross curve? So is it a function of x? Is, is it that LAC is a function of x? No, sir. No, sir. No. Even if x is high, LAC remains same. When can we have a shape like this, LAC, horizontal? Not constant cost industry, rather constant returns to scale. When we have constant returns to scale, LAC becomes enveloped to the short run average cost curve. Of course, constant cost industry is also there, but then we consider there we consider demand and supply shifts. But in general, under constant returns to scale, the long run average cost curve is horizontal, which means that it's invariant to change in output level. So even if output is high, LAC always remains same. Is it okay to everybody now? And it's the envelope of yes. short. Yes? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just yes. have a look at this. What is the competitive equilibrium condition? You now know this. Because it's the Marshallian long run average cost curve must be equal to price. It's not price equal to MC. Because price equal to MC, which we find in the short run, is a temporary situation where we can have profit or loss. And there can be free entry and exit. Ultimately, everything boils down to zero. So that price is equal to average cost. And this is your average cost under CRS. So PX is a function of W is equal to WALX WR plus R AKX WR, which is equal to CX dash, which is a function of W comma R. The whole thing you can write it in this way. So this CX dash is nothing but your LAC. And this is also equal to price. And this price on the left hand side, I've not drawn this figure. This price is determined by equality of industry demand or market demand and market supply. And the firm is nothing but a price taker in the market. Is it okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is the peculiarity of trade models where we consider competitive equilibrium conditions. Now I can ask you that what about zero profit? This is a zero profit condition. Price equal to average cost means total revenue equal to total cost. If we multiply both sides by the same level of output, then total revenue equal to total cost and profits are boiled down to zero. Now can a firm survive? Can people survive with zero profit? What do you think? Is it possible? Is there any answer for this? So I think this level should never be reached because no, no, this is this is there. This is reached. This is a well known. Sir, initially it is possible, but not in long run. Always possible. Who are the owners of the firms? The capitalists. The capitalists are the owners of the firm, isn't it? Yes, sir. Okay. You agree? Capitalists are the owners of the firm. What is the earning of, what are the two classes, broad two classes for this model? Capitalists and the workers. What is the earning of the workers? It's the wage rate. And what is the earning of the capitalists? It's R, rate of return on capital. So R, AKX is the total earning of the capitalists to produce one unit of output. And WALX is the total earning of the labor class. So basically, profit is included in the earning of the capitalists. So this means actually PX minus WALX equal to RAKX. That RAKX is your profit. But we have taken it to the right hand side and we have considered it as a partner, as an item under cost. But if the capitalists, if we consider the capitalists as the owners of firms that we consider here, then of course it's their profit that is included under this cost item. So that ultimately we write it in the form of a balance sheet that is price is equal to average cost. But the profit here is actually the difference between price and wage cost. Is it okay? So can, is it okay? so can you tell it again? I can't understand. Who are the owners of the farms? The capitalists? Yes, sir. What is their earning? Capital income? Yes, the rent. What is the capital income here? R into AKX? Yes, sir. And what is the labor income? W into ALX? That is the wage bill to produce one unit of output? Yes. Do you agree? Sir. So yes, price sir. minus wage bill is the average profit. That means the profit to produce one unit of output. So profit is what? Profit is actually R into AKX. That means profit is included under R. It's already covered. So, But here it is interpreted as a part of the cost. So that's why it appears that there is no profit. But profit is there. 
because it's the capitalists, they are the owners of the farm, but they treat their income as an item under the cost because they keep their income aside. They know that they need to earn something. That is considered as a part of the cost. So if you look at it in accounting sense, then of course it's a part of the cost. So there is of course zero profit. But just from the economics point of view, this is income of the capitalists and the capitalists are the owners of the firm and they enjoy the profit. And what is the profit then? Price minus wage cost. Is it okay? Yes, sir. So that's why the firms can survive. But remember, this long run average cost curve is envelope of short run average cost curve, as we find here. They are tangent to the minimum points of SAC here. This is a special case because LSE is horizontal because we have constant returns to scale. So we shall now consider this envelope condition. Here, envelope condition does not necessarily mean that it's the tangency of all short run average cost curves. Even we can have envelope condition in the context of isoquants as well as I shall show. So just consider this figure. Consider this unit isoquant. One equal to F of ALX AKX. And you just change the slopes of the isocosts. So initially, the equilibrium is at E1. Then the equilibrium is at E2. Then it becomes equilibrium at E3. So if it gets more flatter, W by R, then equilibrium may be somewhere at E4. But what we can say, this isoquant, this unit isoquant covers all different isocosts, isn't it? So this is the envelope. So if we join E2, E3, E2, E3, we find that we are on the same indifference curve. So this indifference curve or, or the isoquant, production indifference curve or isoquant. So this production indifference curve is the envelope of all isocosts. You got my point? So yes, sir. Okay. Now algebraically, how can I show this? Now we know that one equal to F A L X A K X is the unit isoquant. Now what do we do? We take total differential. So F1 is the marginal productivity of labor to produce one unit of output, and F2 is the marginal productivity of capital to produce one unit of output. This F1 is the first partial derivative, as mentioned here, and F2 is the partial derivative of F with respect to AKX. Now, without loss of generality, we do not consider F2 to be zero. And F1, of course, is positive. In fact, F1, F2, both are positive. So we divide both sides by F2. If we divide both sides by F2 of this equation, what is F1 by F2? It's the ratio of marginal productivity of labor to capital to produce one unit of output. So it is the slope of the isoquant. Got it, everybody? It is the slope of unit isoquant. Is it okay? Yes, sir. The slope of the unit isoquant may be at point E1 or at E2 or even at E3 is always equal to slope of the isocost line if we consider these points of collection of tangencies. So we can replace at equilibrium F1 by F2 by W divided by R. And we can write it in this way. So I shall show from now on the zero equal to W DALX plus R DAKX as the envelope condition. You got it, everybody? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, I'll create a doubt now. I'll solve the doubt as well. Deliberately, I'll create a doubt. The doubt is, had I been a student, I would, I should, definitely I should raise this question. That, yes, I agree, equation three is the envelope condition. But as you said, I should ask the teacher, that envelope condition means change in Lagrangian expression as a result of change in parameter is equal to change in the maximum value or minimum value function as a result of change in the same parameter. But I do not get any flavor of that here in equation three. How do you reconcile between these two? You got my question? You got my question? Here I am saying zero equal to W DALX plus R DAKX is the envelope condition. But just a few minutes back, as I when I just explained the old concepts, there I mentioned the envelope condition in this way. Change in the Lagrangian as a result of change in the parameter 
the same as change in the maximum value or minimum value function as a result of change in the same parameter you got it everybody yes sir yes sir two are different things so how can i say how can you link the next second one i mean the thing i just showed just now he this one sorry very sorry the thing i showed just now this with the envelope condition here it's w d l x plus r d k x whereas this del l del alpha any parameter is equal to del c del alpha any parameter but these two are same is it okay that can't be so i want deliberately to create a doubt my task is also to solve the doubt is the doubt created is it a doubt now it's a doubt to you yes sir i will be very happy if it, if it is actually a doubt to you yes it should be a doubt but i'll solve it now just see here observe carefully you know that f1 by f2 is equal to w divided by r f1 is what marginal productivity of labor marginal productivity of labor is also a function of labor and capital remember for any cobb douglas production function y equal to q equal to l to the power alpha k to the power 1 minus alpha if you take del q del l then it's also a function of l and k so that's why if we consider f1 which is del f del l alx that is also a function of alx akx similarly f2 is also a function of alx akx so it doesn't matter whether we write it as f1 f2 or f1 function of alx akx f2 function of alx akx equal to w divided by r but this is the main culprit this is the main thing this is actually your envelope condition along with the fact that we have a unit iso quant Now, if I solve these two, if I solve these two, we get what? We get the envelope condition f1 by f2. If I solve these two, we write. Just I shall show you. Just after this, if I solve these two, we get a collection of tangency condition, and we can write it as W D A L X plus R D K X. But still, the doubt is not clear because what I have said now, try to argue. But what I have said, I've tried to justify this W D A L X plus R D A K X, but I've not reconciled this with the envelope condition. Just I have said, said that if I can solve these two, I have two equations with two unknowns A L X and A K X. I can I can get this A L X as a function of W and R, and A K X as a function of W and R. So main thing is F one by F two equal to W divided by R. It gives us this equation, but that is not the envelope answer. The answer I wanted. Now comes the answer. Just have a look. You minimize cost subject to unit iso quant. Start from the usual method. This is the envelope result, isn't it? Del L del W, where W is a parameter. Del C X dash instead of C X. Now it's C X dash because it's unit iso quant. It's unit cost. So instead of alpha, I call it W. I call it W. del cx dash del alpha or del w you can check if you carry on this exercise you can check this del cx dash del w gives you alx so as del cx dash del w gives you this is from shepherd's lemma in fact you can check that this del l del w is equal to alx you can check this so as these two are same this is the envelope condition you got my point yes sir yes sir I just see here. Here, how can you reconcile the envelope condition? You can. Just a minute. You can. You can reconcile. How you can reconcile this envelope condition? Now it appears that the doubt is partially cleared, still not fully cleared. I shall clear this doubt fully. Before that, I just want to say a few things. But you know that this is the competitive equilibrium condition or the zero profit condition. On the left hand side we have P X. On the right hand side we have long run average cost, which is W A L X. A L X is a function of W and R. R A K X, which is a function of W and R. Do you agree, everybody? Yes. Sir. Now take total differential of this. If you take total differential, it's D P X. W D A L X plus A L X D W. In this way, we can expand. Now you just collect terms. W D A L X plus R D A K X. 
by this time you are already familiar with this at least that we have already shown that WDALX plus RDAKX equal to zero. So we can write WDALX plus RDAKX equal to zero. Still, reconciliation between envelope condition and envelope theorem is not done. But we know the envelope condition. And I can write this WDALX plus RDAKX equal to zero. So you can collect terms WDALX and RDAKX, just put it zero. So we are left with two terms. These two terms are ALXDW and AKXDR. And after this, we make some simple adjustments. These adjustments is known as hat algebra. It's very simple. Hat means if I write dz by z or d of log z, we call it z cap or z hat. So z is a variable. dz by z is differential of z with respect to z or d of log z. We call it dz by z, is z cap. Is it okay? Yes, sir. So here we deliberately, on the left-hand side, we divide by px. But we can't do this. We need to adjust the right-hand side as well. So we have a px in the denominator on the right-hand side. I deliberately divide dw by w, but I can't do this. I multiply also by w. I deliberately divide dr by r, but I can't do this. I multiply by r. So R A L X by P X. What does it mean? R A L X or W A L X by P X. Sorry, W A L X by P X. It means you know that A L X is what? It is L X divided by X. So it is the wage bill, and here we have total revenue. So it is the total value of the product, and it is the wage bill. So this theta L X, which is W A L X by P X, is the value of share of labor in sector X. Whereas this, please mute your sound. Please, anybody has unmuted your sound, please mute it. And R A K X by P X means it is the share of capital. R A K X means what? K X by X. So R K X is the value of share of capital by total value of output. So we can write after using envelope condition, we can write it in the form as shown by equation six. There are a few things which needs to be noted. That is theta LX plus theta KX is equal to one. How can you say that theta LX plus theta KX is equal to one? That I can show easily. Just see here, theta LX plus theta KX means what? W LX by PXX plus R KX by PXX. If you add these two, in the numerator we have what? In the numerator we have W LX plus R KX. That is total cost. And on in the denominator, we have PXX, which is total revenue. So total revenue equal to total cost, which means it's equal to one. You got my point, everybody? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, let's think about Shepherd's lemma. What is Shepherd's lemma? Del CX by del W is equal to LX. This you know, I've just shown this when I just revised the old concepts. That this is Shepherd's lemma. Del CX by del W equal to LX. Is it okay? Yes, yes sir. sir. The calls just refer to CX dashed as CX by X. So instead of CX, I can write it as CX dashed X. Now, as if I'm changing, taking the partial derivative with respect to the parameters. So it's a corollary to Shepherd's lemma. I'm taking this X out and call it del CX test by del W as LX by X equal to ALX. So this is your result, that this del CX test del W. So when we write in terms of unit cost function, then instead of LX, we write here ALX. So this is the Schaeffer's lemma. The competitive equilibrium condition, as I said, is PX equal to W ALX plus R AKX, but this ALX and AKX are functions of W and R. So this is basically a function of W comma R. So if you just write it instead of writing it in this way, if you write it as PX equal to CX dash W comma R, then take the total differential. Do you agree we can write it in this way? Yes. Is it okay? Yes, sir. So what is del CX dash del W? As I said just now, it's ALX. What is del CX dash del R? As I said just now, AK. So you get the same result as we find in case of equation six. 
So using Shepherd's lemma, you get the same result instead of using any envelope result. So now I'll reconcile. So it's now the time to reconcile because this is Shepherd's lemma. This is envelope theorem. And from this Lagrangian expression, one can easily check, one can easily check that this del L del W ultimately becomes ALX. So here, if we consider unit of quant and we write it mathematically in this way, then we get the same results as that of envelope theorem. Whereas if we just consider it from unit of quant, we write the envelope condition in this way. So it's the other way around. Just as I said, ALX is a function of W comma R or W divided by R. Here also, we can write it in the either in the form of Schiffer's lemma or envelope theorem, or we can use it by using just unit isoquant. So it has some envelope interpretation. So basically, this ALX, how this ALX is obtained, because this is the envelope condition, and ultimately this is equal to ALX. This is the envelope condition. This is equal to AKX. How these two are obtained? These are obtained from the points of tangency. And what is the condition for the point of tangency? The condition for the point of tangency is F1 by F2 equal to W divided by R. And what does it mean? It means 0 equal to W D A L X plus R D K X A K X. Is it okay now? Is there any doubt? No, sir. Is it okay to everybody? Shall I repeat it? I am taking deliberately some more time for this for this part because once the foundation is clear, the whole of your neoclassical trade model will be clear to you. Is it okay? Any question in this regard? Any question, anybody? Without feeling shy, you can ask me. Sir, can you explain once again the graphical approach for deriving the... Uh, yeah, yeah, this is the addition. graphical approach. This is the graphical approach, which is very simple. This is this one equal to F ALX, AKX, is the unit isoquant. Now, it covers so many points of tangency, isn't it? Yes, yes. It covers so many points of tangency. So this is an envelope of isocosts. This one isoquant, unit isoquant. You agree? Now, yes. all these points satisfy the equation f1 by f2 equal to w by r, as I have said here. So I can yes. replace f1 by f2 by w divided by r, and I can write it in this way. So this condition actually implies the tangency condition. That the slope of the unit isoquant is equal to slope of isocost at the point of tangency. Now how, yes, sir. how can I reconcile this with the envelope theorem? I can easily reconcile this. Because just now I have said that this is Schiffer's lemma. And from the Lagrangian expression, I can obtain del L del W equal to ALX. Del L del R equal to AKX. Now how these ALX and AKX are obtained at the optimal level? These are obtained from the tangency conditions. So when I, once I say this, the tangency condition is bound to operate. That means this condition is bound to operate. That means F1 by F2 by W by R is bound to operate. That means this condition is bound to hold. Is it okay? Yes, sir. Got it, sir. Thank you. So that's why we said 0 W A L X plus R D A K X because this is a popular question that what is the use of envelope condition in the con this is not actually envelope theorem, rather the envelope condition. You can reconcile it with envelope theorem uh, in the context of trade theory. This is the envelope condition, which you can show in case of profit competition. Now, just I shall stop this, but before this, I just want to say that the production function, you have this production function. Now, you all know about product exhaustion theorem on the theory of distribution. All of you know, probably, isn't it? You had it in the syllabus earlier in micro. Okay. Yes? I want to see or hear some response. I'll not ask you. Just I'm asking that whether you have heard about this product exhaustion theorem? Yes, sir. Oh, I have heard it. Yes, sir. It means what? Under constant reduction to scale, if each factor is paid according to its marginal product, total product is exhausted. But this is the statement of product exhaustion theorem. Just see here, dx, del x, del lx, which is marginal productivity of labor. This is marginal productivity of capital. And this is lx, x. Is it okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, del x, del lx, this is marginal physical productivity of labor. You can write it as real wage rate, w by px. 
this del x del x is the marginal physical productivity of capital you can write it as rpx now you can just simplify this what does it mean this is theta del x this is theta kx equal to 1 so sum of the shares in value terms is unity remember i said this just a few minutes back i said that the sum of this theta del x plus theta kx equal to 1 this is possible only if product exhaustion theorem holds and product exhaustion theorem holds only if we have constant returns to scale otherwise not so herein lies the significance of constant returns to scale so how important is the role of constant returns to scale in the context of trade theory if there is a question like this what is the significance of constant returns to scale one implication is that the sum of the shares value shares of the workers and the capitalists must sum to equal to one unity is it okay yes sir so this is the first implication second implication again i have considered product exhaustion theorem just see this is marginal physical productivity of labor which is w by px this is marginal physical productivity of capital which is r by px these are lx px now i have made some adjustments i have taken this px to the right hand side and x in the denominator so what is lx by x this is alx what is kx by x akx so what is this this is zero profit condition isn't it this is the competitive equilibrium condition under crs so because of crs we have product exhaustion theorem and because of this product exhaustion theorem we have ultimately the long run competitive equilibrium condition that is price is equal to long run average cost is the intuition clear yes sir yes sir i yes, will not go through the mathematics of elasticity of substitution but just to recall a few things that you know a question was asked that why this will be substituted of course this will be substituted that capital will be substituted by labor because of positive elasticity of substitution so elasticity of substitution means percentage change in capital labor ratio as a result of percentage change in marginal rate of technical substitution marginal rate of technical substitution at equilibrium this is the form at equilibrium that is the slope of the isoc one is equal to the slope of the isoc cost so you can replace mrts by w divided by r so you know this this is the form of the elasticity of substitution Term. you know this already is it okay yes now i have yes. made some deliberate adjustments i have divided the numerator kx by in the numerator kx by x i have adjusted it i have also divided lx by x so it gets adjust, adjusted so here also kx by lx i divide kx by x lx by x so it gets adjusted and we have dw by r by w by r just to change the interpretation i can write it as b akx by alx akx by alx dw by r dw by r so you can call it log of akx by alx because log of d of log x is d of x by x is equal to d of log x but d of z by z means d of log z so can i not write it write it as natural log of akx by ak alx is it okay yes sir. yes, sir. yes sir. Yes, so just make it log. Now you know that log of x divided by y is log x minus log y. So we have done this, and I can write in this way. Plus this is the substitution. I'll not go through the mathematics. These things will be taught in your class when you will face your classes that your teachers will teach you. This is this has wide implications in the context of trade theory, but I'll not go through the mathematics of this. And this is all about the. first part of the lecture so next i shall pass on to the second part second part of the lecture just after this if you have any question for this please keep it for the question and answer session but if if you have any clarificatory question you can ask me just for one minute then i'll give just one minute break just one minute break and after this rather two minutes break two and a half minutes break so after this i shall start the second part it's a very important model that is jones 65 model so do you have any question any clarificatory question yes sir i just Amra. have a small query yes sir from the yeah, okay, just of... put your hand off first then then yes, yes sir 
Yes, sir. The query is that uh, regarding the elasticity of substitution. So, in trait theory, we had learned that the factor in uh, factor intensity days are. How could are you learn? Have you had, you had trait earlier? No, sir. This semester only, I was going through the book, and uh, then I figured it out that factor intensity rays are positively stopped. So, is it that it comes from the positively uh, positive elasticity of substitution? Because the formula appears to be the factor same. Factor intensities are different thing. Because even if you have fixed coefficient production function elasticity of substitution zero, then also you have factor elastic factor intensity conditions. Factor intensity means capital labor ratio in one sector is more than capital labor ratio in the other sector. So one cap sector is capital intensive, another sector is labor intensive. Don't mix it with factor intensity. Rather, elasticity of substitution is equal to zero in case of the Ricardian model, where we have fixed coefficient. Whereas in the Hexterolin model, we have labor and capital as the two factors of production, and there we can substitute between the two. So that is the difference between the each one of the differences, not the main difference. This is uh, one of the difference, major difference between the Sherrillian model and the Ricardian model. So here, yes, sir. At, due to this possibility, of, that's why we can say capital labor ratio. Otherwise, how can you say? Because if there is no question of any, there cannot be any question of substitutability. But you can always compute capital labor ratio. But your isotopic shape will be different. It will be L shaped if there is no elasticity of substitution. Is it okay? Yes, sir. Got it, sir. Just two and a half minutes break. Then again, I'll come back. Just come back. I'll come back for June sixty-five. Uh, this also I delivered for the teachers uh, at Hirombo Chandra College last year. And now I am delivering it for the students. Jones 1965 model. Can you see everybody? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Now I shall start from the assumptions. Uh, these assumptions are very, very important of Jones 765 model. Once these assumptions are clear, the whole thing will be clear to you. So, always for building a model, the building blocks are essential. I know that you don't know anything about Hicks-Sherolin model. So, it's relatively difficult because it's an application of neoclassical trait model, which is basically based on Hicks-Sherolin structure. So, I'll try to make it as simple as much as I can. Now, we consider a small open economy. Now, I shall explain the meaning of small open economy. What is the meaning of a small economy, economy, open economy? It's not Sri Lanka or Maldives. It's not like that. Small open economy 
means the economy is small enough not to affect the world prices. That means the economy is a price taker in the international market. It has not much power to affect the world prices. Say, for example, Bangladesh is a small open economy from the point of view of industrial products, say iron and steel. But it's not a small open economy from the point of view of export of jute, because Bangladesh is a major exporter of jute. Similarly, Sri Lanka is a major exporter of coffee. So Sri Lanka is not a small open economy for coffee export, whereas it's a small open economy for other exports or other imports. So it's it's a, in that sense, it depends upon the type of export basket. India is an exporter of agricultural products as well as softwares. So India is an exporter of Bollywood films as well. So India has a mixed basket. So you can't say it in general for India. But there are some products where India is not the major exporter. India has not much lobbying power in the world market to influence the price. So in that case, India is the price taker. So just under perfect, as in as if we find under perfect competition, the firm is a price taker. Here, the economy is a price taker. So here, that's why we use competitive equilibrium condition. The interpretation is just like that of perfect competition. The firm being a price taker under perfect competition, here the economy is a price taker in the international market. So is it okay, the meaning of small open economy? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. There are two sectors or two commodities, you can call two industries. One is the manufacturing sector, the other is the agricultural sector. I know that India is an exporter of agricultural goods as well as software. Yes. But Jones developed this model in the year 1965, long back. Actually, it's a basic model. It's the father of this new classical trade models. So Jones developed this model in the year 1985, where he assumed, basically, empirically, we observe that the developing countries are exporters of agricultural products and they are importers of manufacturing products. So we call the agricultural sector as the exportable sector because this is potentially the sector which can export its good. So that is an exportable sector. It produces its own good, it can generate some surplus and can export that. So that sector is known as an exportable sector. Whereas manufacturing sector is the importable or the import competing sector. India can produce perfumes, but people may like French perfume. So Indian perfume producers, they need to compete with the imported perfumes from France. So that's why it's an import competing sector or importable sector. Sector M, which is the manufacturing sector. The notations will tell you about the sectors. A stands for agricultural sector and M stands for manufacturing sector. Is it okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The manufacturing sector needs some protection on part of the government. Needs some protection on part of the government means, as I said, India can produce perfume, but people may like French perfume. So that's why, unless there is some tariff, some tax on imported products is imposed on French perfume, Indian producers will not be able to survive. This is known as tariff, which is a duty on the tax on the imported products. Is it okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we consider that the import competing sector is protected by a tariff. It's the duty of the government, it's the responsibility of the government to protect. I have not considered any explicit government sector here because this is not shown in Jones model. But the manufacturing sector is protected by a tariff. Labor and capital are the two primary factors of production. Here we do not take into account of any intermediate input. So labor and capital are the primary factors of production. It's an application of fixture only type of model, but not only only labor, it's not that only labor is used, but also capital is used. Each of the two sectors, agricultural sector uses labor and capital, the manufacturing sectors, they use labor and capital. Now one assumption is made here. here. 
labor can freely move between agricultural sector and manufacturing sector. Similarly, capital can freely move between manufacturing sector and the agricultural sector. A pump set can be used in the manufacturing sector in daytime, but can be used, the same pump set can be used during night time in the agricultural field. So capital can also move freely, not only labor. Transportation costs are not taken into account in this model. One can complicate the model by introducing transportation costs. But remember, in case of model building, we always start from very simple things. Using simple things, if you can show some innovative results, then it's a good model. Using too much, too many things, if you get a result, if you get the same result, it's no credit. Using simple assumptions, if you can obtain some innovative results, that's of course a credit. So is it okay up to assumption number three? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Production function in each sector, this is a standard assumption under this neoclassical trade theory. Production function in each sector exhibits constant readers to scale with diminishing marginal productivity to the variable factor. Since with respect to labor, we have diminishing positive but diminishing marginal productivity of labor. With respect to capital, we have positive but diminishing marginal productivity of capital. So labor here is assumed to be fully employed. You can ask me, that is it possible that in a world where we have so much in developing countries, so much of involuntary unemployment? Yes, of course. We teach these unemployment portions at the postgraduate level. Not only Harris type of unemployment, but that is total type of migration and urban unemployment. Even in general unemployment, we cover all types of unemployment. Of course, involuntary unemployment. And we also split labor into skilled and unskilled category. But these are all extensions of the model. Unless you know the basic model, this is the basic model. If you know this basic model, then only you can extend it, otherwise not. So this is a simplifying, appears simplifying, but this is the starting point, this full employment assumption. It can easily be extended, easily be extended to show unemployment. But what Jones has shown, it's a revolutionary model, that even if you introduce unemployment, basic results will not change. Basic results of Jones' model will remain same. The Harris and Todaro model, the Harris Todaro model has been extended by Corden and Findlay, and they have introduced this type of Jones type of assumption in the year 1975, but they found that the results are same, so it doesn't matter. So don't worry about full employment. Is it okay? Assumption number five? Yes, yes. sir. Yes. Yes, now sir. comes a very important assumption. Manufacturing sector is assumed to be more capital intensive than the agricultural sector in physical and value terms. I'll explain the meaning. And manufacturing sector is assumed to be more capital intensive than the agricultural sector means always, whatever may be the wage rental ratio, always Kx by Lx is greater than, I mean, uh, Km by Lm is greater than Ka by Ala. That means the capital labor ratio in the manufacturing sector is more than the capital labor ratio in the agricultural sector. This is empirically valid. Because in agriculture, we need more of labor and less of capital. Whereas in manufacturing, we need relatively more capital, relatively less labor. So the capital labor ratio in the manufacturing is always higher than the capital labor ratio in the agricultural sector. And I shall show in this model, this is true for all wage and rental, rate of return on capital. If somehow, due to some wage rental ratio, the sign gets reversed, that means agricultural sector becomes more capital intensive than the manufacturing sector. We say it's a case of factor intensity reversal. That will be taught in the context of fixture rolling model. I will not cover in detail. But here there is no question of factor intensity reversal. I shall discuss it tomorrow, factor intensity reversal. But there is no question of factor intensity reversal in this model. Throughout for all factor prices, manufacturing sector is more capital intensive. That means its capital labor ratio is more than the agricultural sector. Is it okay? Uh, sir, can you please explain this uh, assumption once more? 
especially which part which part uh, so it's not clear to you i have not explained physical and value yet but i have explained that manufacturing sector is more capital intensive than agricultural sector now when i said capital intensive what does it mean it means capital labor ratio of the manufacturing sector is it okay to you yes sir uh, so manufacturing uh, capital labor ratio of the manufacturing sector is more than the capital labor ratio of the agricultural sector yes okay sir. thank you sir so when we just consider it in terms of capital labor ratio we call it in physical terms and when we multiply capital with rate of return on capital labor with lm with wage rate of labor convert it into value we call it in value terms it's true both in physical terms as well as in value terms you got it everybody you got yes, it sir. you lost otherwise there is nothing to worry about it it's empirically true and there is no question of factor intensity reversal what is factor intensity reversal this is true for all factor prices now it's not that there exists some factor prices for which agricultural sector is more capital intensive than manufacturing sector it's not true in this model because this model is then not valid it becomes an unstable model then it can be shown so throughout this assumption is made which is a reasonable assumption which is also which is also empirically valid if the reverse happen we call it factor intensity reversal but there is no factor intensity reversal is it okay yes sir yes sir question number 7 uh, sorry assumption number 7 is linked with assumption number 1 as i said it's a small open economy as the farm is a price taker under perfect competition here the economy is a price taker so perfect competition prevails in both product and factor markets the commodity prices are given just for a farm the farm being a price taker prices are given for the farm the farm adjusts in a manner such that price becomes equal to long run average cost that is the equilibrium condition so here also the economy is a price taker so the prices international prices are given exogenously for the economy the economy adjusts in a manner such that the price becomes equal to the long run average cost so that there is zero profit so here commodity prices and the factor endowments by factor endowment mean total labor supply total capital supply these are given total labor supply at a point of time is given by the level of population is given total capital stock at a given point of time is given there can be variation in demand for labor and demand for capital but supply of capital supply of labor they are fixed these are known as endowments is it okay yes sir yes yes sir so is there any money how can you measure how can you measure any commodity there is no money here i have not taken into account of any money market condition unlike islm model where we have the money market equilibrium condition here there is no money there are only two sectors agriculture and the manufacturing sector it can be a monetized dual economy but basically the conceptual thing is that here one of the commodity is considered as the numerator commodity you know under classical model this is a neo classical model there in the context of dichotomy where we consider determination of monetary variables and real variables we express one commodity as the numerator numerator means we express other one commodity in terms of the other commodity so if agricultural product is here without loss of generality you can consider any one usually agricultural product is considered as the numerator so everything is measured in terms of agricultural sector so the price of manufacturing is pm price of agriculture is pa so actually the price should be pm by pa because it's expressed in terms of the agricultural product is it okay this is the meaning of numerator numerator means one commodity there is no money you can't express the units of the prices in terms of rupees so you need to express manufacturing commodity in terms of agricultural commodities that means three units of manufacturing commodities can be expressed in terms of how many of agriculture how much of agricultural commodities you got my point there is no money market condition here you got my point now Yes. Now that commodity, which is the measuring rod through which it's expressed, here it is the agricultural commodities. 
we call it the new model new model is very interesting to observe a new mer air new model means one commodity is expressed in terms of the other so there is no question of absolute price of manufacturing pm is the absolute price of manufacturing but if you consider new model it should be pm by pa isn't it because if you expressed manufacturing price in terms of the agricultural price but pm is fixed pa is fixed because they are given in the international market the economy being a price taker you can consider without loss of generality pa as one because if you consider pa as one then pm by pa is same as pm it's fixed you can ask me why it's one you can consider it as 47 of course i can consider 47 then i should write pm by 47 it looks odd it will increase increase the clumsiness of algebra so to make matter simple you can consider it because it it will not throw any additional light to, to your analysis so to make matter simple we consider pa to be one so that pm by pa can be written as pm you got my point everybody yes sir yes sir so you need not worry about the relative prices so that is the way we express this we just because questions were raised earlier that there is no money market condition how can you justify all these things that is this is the way one can justify i shall not go through the list of notations but just i want to say a few things here the international price from now on i shall denote it by pj star say pm star pa star whereas domestic price by pm and pa so for the agricultural product pm star is equal to pa star equal to 1 for the agricultural product actually there is no difference between domestic price and the international price for the manufacturing product there is a difference between international price and manufacturing and domestic price in what sense because domestic in case of manufacturing product the domestic producers are protected by tariff so something is added to international price to french perfume if the price is pm star you add some tariff to it so that the domestic price becomes pm star plus something equal to pm you got my point yes yes sir yes sir so there is a difference between pm and pm star but pa is equal to pa star in fact that is equal to 1 that i shall ask you now we know that labor and capital you are not perfectly mobile so labor can move capital can move it's not like that manufacturing wage is higher than the agricultural wage because in that case all work force will move from agricultural sector to the manufacturing sector there will be more labor in the manufacturing sector which will create downward pressure on wages so labor will then return back to the agricultural sector and this will continue until the factor prices are equalized so here we shall not denote wage rate in the manufacturing sector by w wm neither we shall denote it by wm nor we shall denote for the agricultural sector the wage rate by wa rather we shall use the common notation w because the manufacturing sector wage rate and the agricultural sector wage rate are same it's not that it's more lucrative because labor can move freely labor will always move where the wage rate is high in fact at the post graduate level we develop these models we make some wage rate fixed at a higher level due to trade union pressure and what happens we check we find that there exists involuntary unemployment but sometimes it's the informal sector which absorbs the workforce but i shall not go through these complications because all these are extensions of jones 65 model so better concentrate on this jones 65 model wage rate is common similarly rate of return on capital is also common is it okay yes sir yes sir yes sir so i shall consider the implications of tariff let imp it's not important imp denotes import let imp denotes import of french perfume so if i put a tariff if i call it ad valorem tariff ad valorem tariff means it's a tariff imposed on the value so actual price is pm star so what is the total revenue from this import pm star into imp but if you put a tariff on the total revenue or the total value then tariff inclusive price tariff inclusive total revenue becomes pm star into imp plus t times pm star into imp 
this IMP is an input. So this is the tariff inclusive total value. So what is the average value? Average price means, average revenue means price. So what is the average value? You divide by input. So you get the average value. So it becomes PM star into PM star plus IMP gets cancelled out plus T times PM star. So it's PM star into 1 plus T. So when we have add value M tariff, we do not write PM star plus T. Rather we write PM star times 1 plus T equal to PM. You got my point? Everybody? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now IMP may confuse you. Might confuse you. So you replace it by XM. This is the total value of output of the whole import competing sector. So the price for the import competing sector, because they are also protected. So the total value becomes like this. So divide by XM. XM, XM gets cancelled. So when we have add value, add value means the tax is imposed on value, not the commodity itself. We write it as PM star into 1 plus T. On the other hand, if the tax is imposed not as add value, but as specific on the commodity itself, not on value, then it should be T times IMP, not T times PM star into IMP. In that case, cancel out IMP or cancel out XM, it becomes PM star in plus T. So this is the difference between a specific tariff and ad valorem tariff. When we have ad, we shall use ad valorem tariff. So when we have ad valorem tariff, we have PM star into 1 plus T. Whereas we have specific tariff, it's PM star into PM star plus T. However, if PM star is equal to 1, then it doesn't matter whether it's ad valorem or specific because it becomes 1 plus T if PM star is 1 it also becomes 1 plus T. Is it okay? Yes. Is it okay to everybody? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is very... Yes, sir. Really, yes. This is very important. So here we have assumed this. PA equal to PA star equal to 1 and PM equal to PM star equal to 1 plus T. So this is a very basic thing Next, as I, as I have said, this all this small AIJs, ALM, AKM, all these are functions of W comma R. It doesn't matter whether it's W divided by R or W comma R. But let me just show you one thing here, because these things you know. This ALJ in general, J for M or A, it's LJ by XJ. Is it okay? So LJ you can write ALJ times XJ. So J stands for M sector M or for sector A. I hope this is okay. Yes, sir. So this is in general theta LM, which is the value share. You can write J as M or J as A. So I did not repeat all these things. I shall just show you capital intensity condition. Capital intensity condition for sector M is KM by LM. I can write it in this way. This is KM divided by XM. This is LM divided by XM. I can deliberately divide XM. I can call it AKM by ALM. Can I not call it? Capital labor ratio is AKM by... Similarly, just one thing I just want to change here. This is a correction. I should call it A. Just see here. Sorry. So can you just see, this is K by XA, K by LA, capital intensity for sector A. Capital intensity for sector A is KA by LA. So it's K divided by XA, LA divided by XA. So it's AKA by LA. So when I say that sector M is more capital intensive than sector A in physical terms, it means KM by LM is greater than KA by LA. You agree? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So K by LA, M, KM by LM is greater than K by LA means AKM LM is greater than AKA LA. It's the same thing. And AKM is a function of W comma R. This is a function of W comma R. It's a function of W comma R. And this is true for all W and R. It's not that there exists some W by R, W and R, such that the, in, the inequality gets reversed. If it gets reversed, we call it factor intensity reversal, but it's not true here. Here throughout, for all W and R, sector M is more capital intensive than sector A. I hope this is clear to you, to everybody. Yes, sir. 
he has just considered various types of notations. I can write it as km by k, which is the share of km in total k, and we call it lambda km, lambda ln. But I'm not going through all these things now. Let's look, have a look here. A km by a ln greater than a k by a ln. Now, I can deliberately multiply both sides by r divided by w, and can divide the numerator by pm here, denominator by pm, divide the numerator by pa here, divide by pa. It doesn't matter because PA is one and PM, PM gets cancelled out. Is it okay? Do you agree? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, what is this? RKM by PM, XM, it's theta KM. What is this? WLM by PM, XM, it's theta LM. What is this? This is theta K. This is theta LM. So, if we start with this, that sector M is more capital intensive than sector A, in physical terms, we end with Sector M is more capital intensive than sector A in value terms as well. This means sector M, this is measured in value terms because we have the values here. So these two must be same. If it is physical, if it is capital intensive, if sector M is capital intensive, then sector A in physical terms, it must be so in value terms. Otherwise, the model becomes unstable. Is it okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So now I shall... This part once more. Which part? Tell me. The uh, last part that you stated out that it should be... Uh, Your name, please. Your name? Adosho Chatterjee, sir. So this is very simple. This is the simplest of all the mathematics. Why can't you follow this? Okay, so PM, you, Please pay attention. You just PM, PM. You divide both sides. Deliver it. This is delivered. It. This is also delivered. You got it. This is yeah. R divided by W. This is R divided by W. So this is just spoon feeding what I'm doing. R came... By PMXM. This is WLM by PMXM. So RK by PAXA. WLA by PAXA. So what is this? This is theta KM, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is theta LM. So if AKM by ALM is greater than AKLM, AK by ALM, then obviously in terms of theta is also true. That means if sector M is more capital intensive than sector A in physical terms, it must be so in value terms as well. Yes, sir. Got it. Now, the equation of structure. As I said, I hope now that it's clear to you the competitive equilibrium condition for the two sectors. Yes, other show. Is it okay to you? The competitive. Yes, sir. To everybody, is it okay to you? Any doubt? Yes, sir. AKM R plus ALM W is the average cost. And PM long run average cost. Long run Marshall Yan average cost. And PM is the price. PM is PM star into 1 plus T because it's protected by tariff. So if T changes, PM will change. And PA is nothing but equal to PA star. It's the exportable sector. And that is equal to 1. So it doesn't matter. You can write it as 1. This is the competitive equilibrium. This is capital cost plus labor cost. So these are the zero profit conditions as well. Is it okay? Is it okay to everybody? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. A perfect mobility of capital. What is AKM XM? What is AKM? AKM is KM divided by XM, isn't it? AKM is KM divided by XM. Yes. So AKM is AKM times XM is what? KM, isn't it? Agree? Just on a piece of paper, you yes, write. Yes, sir. Just I've shown here. I've shown it here. Just here. Just see. What is LM? ALM, ALM, ALJ rather, LJ by XJ. So what is LJ? It's ALJ times XJ. So what is AKJ? It's KJ by XJ. So what is KJ? It's AKJ times XJ. So K, we can always say, I hope this is clear. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I can always write AKM, XM as KM and this as KA. So, KM is the amount of capital required by sector M and K is the amount of capital required by sector A. These two are same capital, so we can add these two. This is the total demand for capital. And on the right hand side, capital supply or endowment is given. This is the total supply of capital. You got my point, everybody? So, there is full yes. employment of capital. Yes. Similarly, ALM XM is LM because by definition, ALM is LM divided by XM. So ALM times XM is LM. ALA by definition is LA by XA. So XA times ALA is LA. So
so you can write it as as this is written here. You can write it as L M plus L A equal to L. So you find this is full employment of capital. This is full employment of labor. Is it okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we have four equations in the model. This completes the model. How the model works? We have four equations in the model. What are the unknowns in this model? Can any one of you say what are the unknowns in this model? It's general equilibrium, not partial equilibrium. So what are the unknowns? Can any one of you try? I'll not mind if you are. If your answer is wrong, I'll not mind. Just try. Can any one of you try? Anybody from any college? Please don't feel shy. If you can't, then I'll, of course I'll say. But I'll be very happy if you can try at least. At least your answer may be wrong, but that will help you as well to clear your confusion. Please try. Anybody from Mohanipur Education? Or from Heritage College, or from anywhere. Okay, so you won't be able to answer this. So let me see. Sir, R and W. Yeah, R and W in equations. Very good. From which college you are? Sir, Bethune College. Huh? Sir, Bethune College. Bethune College. Okay, and here in equations three, three and four. Already said R and W. In equations three and four. What are the two unknowns? You are right. X M and X A. So there are four equations with four unknowns. R and W. Okay, just mute your microphone now. Now just tell me anybody that from equations one and two, can we solve for R and W? The answer is yes. Don't think A K M is an unknown. Rather, A K M is expressed. Of course, it's an unknown. But A K M is expressed in terms of W and R. A L M is expressed in terms of W and R. A K A is expressed in terms of W and R. A L A is also expressed in terms of W and R. So effectively, the unknowns are W and R. So as P M and P A are given because the economy is a price taker, so P M star is given, P A star is given, the tariff rate at a point of time is given. So P M is given, P A is given. So P M P A being given. And the, effectively, the unknowns are W and R on the right hand side of equations one and two. We can solve for W and R from equations one and two. Is it okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Once W and R are known, we can plug these values of W and R here, so that the input-output ratios or the capital and the labor coefficients are known, isn't it? If you put the values of W and R, you know AKM. You know AK, you know ALM, you know AL. Is it okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So from yes. equations three and four, you can solve for XM and XA. So whole model can be decomposed into two parts. One is the price system, and there the variables that is W and R are determined independently of the output system. Isn't it? Because when we solve for W and R. We need not talk about three and four because we can easily solve for W and R from here because they are independent of our equations three and four. But once W and R are known, we can solve for X M and X A. So the variables in under the price system are independent of the output system. This is known as the decomposability. This is all written here, so don't worry. This is known as the decomposability property of the model a question came probably last year about this decomposability property this is this is a speciality of this model where the model can be decomposed into two parts where the price system is independent of the output system any change in factor endowment say k or l will not change w and r because w and r are determined independently you got it everybody yes sir This is the decomposability property. Other shot, you is it okay to you? Yes, sir. So any change in the factor endowment will not change the factor prices due to the decomposability property. So if K changes, so suppose there is a shock in the system, so K increases, it will 
Of course, it will affect XM and XA, but it will not affect W and R because they are predetermined from the price system. So this is a special feature of this model. So we determine W and R, of course, endogenously. Whatever be the endogenous values, we always say that there is no factor intensity reversal, so that sector M is more capital intensive than sector A. But this decomposability property is very important because any change in factor endowment will not lead to any change in the factor prices. So I shall not go through the working of the model in detail. Now, I shall not go through the detailed calculus of these price changes because actually I'll advise you to know these things intuitively. Though a question came probably last year about the impact of price magnification effect on uh, in Jones model. But basically, more importantly, more important in this context is the some of the implications of this result. The implications are more important rather than the mathematical derivations. The mathematical proof are shown here. I shall give you some intuitive explanations, which are very simple, which are not at all difficult. So you always can check from the Competitive. Are you following me? Is it okay? Yes, sir. So, from equation one, which is the competitive equilibrium condition from the manufacturing sector, you can always check that if we take the total differential, we have a term like this, DPM equal to total differential of all these terms. Now, you can use this envelope property as already explained, and you can eliminate two terms here. So that WDALM plus RDAKM, so WDALM and RDAKM, you can put it as zero. You can retain the first two terms and do some mathematics after this. But I am not interested in this mathematics. Of course, this is important. But what matters to me is result six. You see that change in PM is equal to theta KM R hat plus theta LM W hat. Now tell me, what is the sum, SUM sum of theta KM plus theta LM? One. 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 So it's the weighted average. So PM's hat is the weighted average of R and W hat, R hat and W hat. So change in the price level of the manufacturing sector is the weighted average of change in the rate of return of capital and change in the wage rate of workforce. Is it okay? Yes, yes sir. Similarly, yes, sir. you can say the change in the price level, I know that this is one, but suppose for the time being I'm assuming it to be A, PA. So change in the price level of the agricultural sector is the weighted average of change in the rate of return on capital and change in the wage rate. Because sum of these two, theta k plus theta l equal to 1. So this is weighted average. I'm not going to the mathematics behind this. But what I am saying here, I shall go to some of the, I shall pass over to some intuitive arguments. So if there is an increase in PM, if you consider the demand for capital, sector M is more capital intensive. So naturally, increase in PM means the value of marginal productivity of capital curve will shift to the right, isn't it? Yes. Is it okay to everybody? If there is an increase in PM, had it been a labor intensive tech sector, the value of marginal productivity of labor shifts to the right and W increases. Here, PM increases means value of marginal productivity of capital shifts to the right and R increases. Whereas if PA increases, which is a labor intensive sector, the value of marginal productivity of labor in that sector increases, W also increases. So both R increases and W increases. If the increase in PM is more than the increase in PA, then the in, because sector M is capital intensive, the increase in R will be more than the increase in W. Let me repeat. If there is an increase in PA, agricultural price, agricultural sector being the labor intensive sector, the value of marginal productivity of labor will shift to the right. So the wage rate will increase. Again, if PM increases, the value of marginal productivity of capital will shift to the right. So the rate of return on capital will increase, being the capital intensive sector. So both R increases and W increases. Why? Due to a change in PM and PA. If we assume increase in PM is more than the increase in PA, of course we should have considered focus more on increase in rate of return on capital than the increase in the wage rate. Is it okay? 
Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is what is reflected by this mathematics. I'm not going to this mathematics. You just see here, this change is it can be expressed in terms of R at minus W at. But I'm not going without going through the algebra. I'm just saying this. Let's see here. If P M hat is greater than P hat, this is positive. It can be shown that R hat should be exceed W hat. And this determinant theta is actually the capital intensity condition that I want to show here. Now remember. What is PM by PA? PM by PA is actually, so if I write it as small p, it is actually, if you take log, it becomes P hat is equal to PM hat minus PA hat. So it is actually the reciprocal of terms of trade. Terms of trade means exportable price by importable price or import competing price. Whereas here it is import competing price by exportable price. So if PM increases, it's not good for the economy. It means a deterioration or deterioration of the terms of trade. Is it okay? Yes, sir. So basically, when PM hat exceeds PA hat, we find that there is a deterioration of the terms of trade. We have already shown that PM hat greater than PA hat. It shows R hat greater than W hat. But you should not forget that from this equation, from equation six, from equation six, so I'm not going through the mathematics, just showing you the intuition. From equation six, as you said already, PM hat is the weighted average of R hat and W hat. So always the weighted average lies between two extreme values. You know that. Is it okay? Right, sir. So you don't know a priori which one is higher, but you know R hat should, lie, should exceed W hat because if PM hat is greater than P hat, then R hat should exceed W hat. So as PM hat is the weighted average of R hat and W hat, so PM hat being the weighted average, it should lie in between R hat and W hat. Is it okay? Yes, sir. Similarly, is it okay to everybody? Yes, sir. Similarly, I have already explained that PA hat is the weighted average of R hat and W hat. PA hat is the weighted average of R hat and W hat. Now we have already expressed, we have already explained that R hat exceeds W hat. So R hat should be ex greater should be greater than P hat and P hat should be greater than W hat. Just like that of the earlier one. Now you combine these two with the condition that PM hat is greater than P hat. Because this is possible if and only if PM hat is greater than P hat. So if you combine 12 and 13, subject to this condition, then you can rewrite it in this way. R hat is the highest increase, then we have PM hat, then we have PA hat, then we have W hat. So if PM increases by one unit, R increases by more than one unit, and W increases by a lesser amount, provided PM increase in PM is greater than increase in PA. This is the price magnification effect. This is known as price magnification effect. Is the implication of equation 14 clear to you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, suppose there is no change in PA. Suppose there is an increase in tariff. If there is an increase in tariff, PM increases. But PA does not change, so PA hat becomes zero. So how can you rewrite this equation? R A hat greater than PM hat, greater than zero, greater than W hat. So as a result of an increase in tariff, R increases and wage rate falls. You got my point? You got it, sir. This is known as the Stolper-Samuelson theorem. Now I shall pass over to the Stolper-Samuelson theorem, but before that, I shall just explain one more theorem, and then I shall pass over to Stolper-Samuelson theorem with a few implications, and I'll finish after this by 6.30. So let me just for the time being, just let me pass on to another theorem. So price magnification effect came last year. So it's linked with stolper samuelson theorem. And stolper samuelson theorem is also linked with textual in theorem, uh, sorry, Lipzinski theorem. Now, there is a famous theorem which we can use, which we use in the context of external in model, which we use in case of Jones model, that is Lipzinski theorem. My advice is not to go through the output magnification effect, unnecessarily doing mathematics. Rather, focus on the intuition. Just this will answer many of your doubts. Just 
forget about the equations forget about the mathematics just throw away the mathematics and look at this results suppose we focus on equations 3 and 4 suppose there is an increase in capital stock suppose there is an increase in capital stock k increases as i said the model shows decomposability property so even if k increases w and r will remain unchanged do you agree yes sir so if even if k increases w and r will remain unchanged so even if k increases this akm ak alm ala will remain unchanged now when k increases capital stock increases which sector will take advantage of this situation common sense says yes manufacturing will take advantage of this situation because it is the capital intensive sector so manufacturing sector will employ more of capital but the machine will remain idle machines will remain idle if it cannot appoint labor only if it can appoint some labor some labor at least maybe capital is higher then only the machine will machines will not remain idle and production will increase so manufacturing sector will appoint some workforce from the agricultural sector the workers in the agricultural sector to receive the same wage may think that in future their wage rate might increase because it's a better sector so they will go go to the cities and will get absorbed in the manufacturing sector but there will be labor shortage for the agricultural sector because total labor endowment is given if labor draw, uh, moves from agricultural sector to the manufacturing sector with more capital and labor this sector being labor intensive xm must expand but the labor intensive sector suffers because labor moves away from the agricultural sector so it cannot produce much because it's dependent more on labor so its output is bound to fall just mechanically you can think that even if k changes w and r remain unchanged so if xm increases l being given x is bound to fall but this is the logic so when capital intensive capital endowment increases the capital intensive sector expands and the labor intensive sector contracts this is ribzinski theorem is it okay similarly when labor endowment increases the labor intensive sector which is agriculture expands and the capital intensive sector which is manufacturing contracts this is ribzinski theorem is it okay to everybody the intuition yes sir yes. in general i can say if factor endowment increases the sector which is intensive in that factor say capital will expand and the sector which is unintensive in that factor will contract so this is the general statement all these things are explained here all these things are explained under the ribzinski theorem without going through mathematics you can always explain this even passing through the road sitting in the bus sitting in metro you can explain it to anybody so this is the intuition all the intuitions are given intuitions are more important no need for all this mathematics okay but naturally for the good students i should say they should go through the mathematics to make you more confident in solving the results but that is not so important for the exams i don't think so unless the paper setter sets this question but i don't like these questions actually this mathematical results is okay the intuition is very very simple so no question of uh, going to the output magnification effect even for price magnification effect also i think a better way to consider it in terms of stolpa samuelson theorem as i said ribzinski theorem says that as capital endowment increases the capital intensive sector expands whereas as labor endowment increases the labor intensive sector expands and the capital intensive sector contracts so what about the stolpa samuelson theorem stolpa samuelson theorem says that if price of the manufacturing sector increases due to some reason maybe tariff increase then the rate of return on the factor in which that sector is intensive so what is the rate of return on factor in which that sector is intensive if the price of the manufacturing sector is increases all of us know that the manufacturing sector is capital intensive so the rate of rate of return on the factor which is capital here in which it is intensive that is rate of return on capital must increase and the rate of return on the factor in which it is unintensive that is labor will fall this is just the dual of ribzinski 
Is it okay? Yes, sir. Now you can easily guess it from here. You can easily guess it from the price magnification effect. From the price magnification effect, actually, it is just magnified, nothing else. Just have a look at this equation. Say P A hat equal to zero. If P M increases, P M hat being positive, then R increases. That is the rate of increase return of the factor in which it, this sector is intensive. That is its capital intensive. So its rate of return increases, and the sector in which it is unintensive. That is its unintensive in labor. That's rate of return, and the unintensive factors rate of return. That is labor wage rate. Zero greater than W hat means W hat is negative, so that should fall. So this is very important. Here the only additional thing for magnification effect is that your R hat increases at a higher rate than the increase in PM. Nothing else. It's the additional result that it shows. But otherwise, the main implication lies in Stolper-Samuelson theorem, and this is Stolper-Samuelson theorem, which I have explained here. So this mathematics are done to make whole thing clear to you. But intuitively, you can always explain the results, and always examiners prefer intuitive results. So this is explained in terms of tariff. It's up to you. You'll have to go through these mathematical results and check the results easily. You can check the results easily. My interest lies in the implications of Jones 65 model for policy analysis. Just one thing I want to ask you. Just I didn't see that. Whether you can answer this, then I shall finish this by saying the policy implications, which are very simple, not at all difficult. Uh, first of all, as I said, as K increases, the factor prices remain unaffected, and we have the Lipinski effect. X M increases, X M falls. However, when we have the Stolper-Samuelson effect, P M increases, R increases, and W falls. Now, just tell me. Whether it leads to any change in the output levels as well, as a result of Stolper-Samuelson, as a result of Rybinski, there is change in the output level. There is no change in factor prices due to decomposability property. Whereas in case of Stolper-Samuelson, factor prices change. Will it lead to ch any change in the output level? That is my point. Anybody can answer? I'll be very happy if you can answer this at least partially. Using your intelligence, but I won't mind if you can't answer it properly. At least you can try. Yes, anybody? Anybody from Hawani Board Education, or anybody from Bethune or Brebon Heritage? No. Okay. Just let me tell you. Can you hear me, everybody? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. sir. Let me tell you. It's very simple. If P M increases, as I said, R increases and W falls. You agree, everybody? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. R increases yes, and W falls. So R increases and W falls means what? W by R falls, isn't it? W divided by R falls. So labor yes, becomes cheaper, isn't it? So if labor becomes yes. cheaper. Keeping this X M and X at the initial equilibrium level, if labor becomes cheaper, we find labor is substituted for capital, isn't it? A capital is substituted for by labor, isn't it? So people will demand for more labor. So A L M will increase and A L A will increase. So given X M and X A, A L M increases and A L A increases means there is an increase in demand for labor, whereas supply of labor remains same. Whereas capital becomes expensive. Means capital demand will fall, A K M will fall, and A K will fall. So there is an increase in demand for labor, which means that there is shortage of labor, and capital demand falls means effectively there is excess supply of capital. So it's similar similar to that of Rybinski. It's not pure Rybinski because there is no change in K or L, but it creates a situation. Of excess supply and labor shortage, so the capital-intensive sector will expand and the agricultural sector will contract. So X M will increase and X M will fall. Is it okay? Yes, sir. So this is a Rybinski type effect. This is not pure Rybinski, rather a Rybinski type effect, which is explained here. So from Stolper-Samuelson effect, we can generate a Rybinski type effect, 
but from Lipzinski effect, we can't generate any Stolper Samuelson effect. This is due to the decomposability nature of the model. Okay, so just skipping these mathematics, all these things, just going to the last part. This is the Lipzinski type effect. This is explained here. So this is explained in page number 25. Just go through the intuition. Intuitions are always given here. Just ignore the mathematics. The implications of Jones 1965 model for policy analysis in developing countries. But there are various ways I can introduce this. I can consider this Jones model for policy analysis. First of all, now we have a phase of liberalization. I have said about increase in tariff. But what we can do, we can consider a cut in tariff. A fall in tariff means a drive towards liberalization. Isn't it? Do you agree? Yes, sir. If you open up, that means allow more importers, more foreign perfumes to come to our country, more Reed and Taylor shirts to come our country, Van Eusen, Peter England to come our country, so that they can compare, compete with the domestic producers of Ahmedabad mill. So that is liberalization. That means we're opening up. That is tariff liberalization. So that can be captured through the stall per Samuelson theorem. Just instead of increase in PM, if you have a decrease in PM, so R will fall and W will increase. Isn't it? And you can find out the sectoral effects as well. XM will fall and XA will increase. You can easily check through this model. So you can consider effects of liberalization in terms of this model. Tariff cut. Now regarding capital, foreign capital or FDI, inflow of foreign capital, there is no room for foreign capital in this model. So what we need to do here in this model, what we need to do here in this model, just a minute, we do not have any scope for introducing foreign capital unless we consider K is equal to KD plus KF. What does it mean? K is equal to total capital. It is the sum of, SUM sum of domestic capital and foreign capital. When can we add these two? We can add these two when domestic capital and foreign capital are perfect substitutes. That means it doesn't matter whether you buy a mobile from, from India or you buy it from Singapore. All types of models nowadays are available in India, in all countries, even in some of the African countries. You can find all types of models. It doesn't matter whether you buy a jeans from here or from Taiwan. So domestic capital and foreign capital are all types of computer are available now. So domestic capital and foreign capital are considered as perfect substitutes. They are same in case under liberalization. So if given KD, if KF increases, then K increases, which creates a Rybzinski effect. That XM increases and XA falls. So if there is foreign capital inflow, we find that the manufacturing sector expands and the agricultural sector contracts, which is a common result. We find in case of in case of FDI, that is the agriculture gets affected, whereas the manufacturing sector is benefited. And the employment also increases in the manufacturing sector and the agricultural sector employment gets affected. You got my point, everybody? Yes, so. Whereas, if there is an increase in tariff, as I said just now, that increase in tariff means the domestic manufacturing sector is protected, R increases and W falls. And as I said here, R increases and W falls means there is shortage of labor and excess supply of capital, which means XM increases. So, our purpose was to give protection to the domestic manufacturing import competing sector. So, if through an increase in tariff, we can give some protection to the manufacturing sector by increasing their level of output. So these are the implications of Jones 65 model. The main reference is the article by Jones. If it is not available, sometimes the paper is not available. I have a copy of the paper. I can send it to the group. But it's a very difficult paper. Then see Caves, Frankel and Jones, supplement to chapter 7, fifth edition. Or you can also see Caves and Jones, but there the chapter name is different. Chapter maybe maybe sector five or six. You can also see Rajota Chakshu. But first of all, go through this note. It will help you. Thank you so much.
so it's now the time for questions and answers nilendu are you here yes sir yes is there any question in the or you can ask even in the youtube there can be questions if anyone want to ask any question please unmute yourself yes sir sir just i just have a small query sir yes yes sir so the question is uh, can you sir revisit the price magnification effect once again like how do we say that that uh, pxy py will increase more that portion can you explain it once again okay. which one you say sir the price magnification yeah, yeah i know but which part this one yes sir sir how did you construct that equality that w greater than py that that kind of oh, this inequality, e, 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 yes sir how could we say uh, that yeah, r hat greater than pm hat greater than w hat is it okay to you because pm hat is the weighted average of r hat and w hat as i said if pm increases more naturally pm increases if pa does not increase then actually if pm increases r will increase and w will fall so actually if we say pm increases more than pa then naturally r will increase more than increase in w because it's the capital intensive sector relatively more capital intensive sector and relatively less labor intensive sector so it will need more and more of demand more and more of capital so the demand for capital vmpk curve will shift more to the right so r hat will increase more than increase in w and this is also true mathematically but I do not rely on the mathematics result, but actually it can be shown easily due to the capital intensity condition. So up to this is clear. Is it okay? Yes, sir. Is it okay? You ask the question. That's why. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is fine, sir. Now, now you come to the weighted average condition. P M hat is the weighted average of R hat and W hat. The weighted average must lie between R hat and W hat, isn't it? Yes, sir. as i already said r hat is greater than w hat so pm hat must lie in between r hat and w hat is it okay yes sir similarly uh, pa hat is the weighted average of r hat and w hat but i have already said that r hat is greater than w hat so pa hat must lie in between r hat and w hat so the main thing is that r hat and w hat will lie at the two extremes now regarding pm hat and pa hat we should need one condition should fulfill one condition that is pm hat is greater than pa hat so that's why we can arrange it in this way that's why we can arrange it in this way that r hat is at the extreme left w hat at the extreme right pm hat and pa hat but remember these two are the extreme conditions extreme this is the magnification effect that pm increases by one unit r increases by more than one unit and w increases by less than one unit is it okay yes sir so pm hat greater yeah. than p yes sir so pm hat greater than pa hat that is made deliberately or we assume that no we assume that we, we assume, assume that. that okay okay suppose there is a deterioration of the terms of trade if there is an improvement in the terms of trade we get the opposite result so that pa hat is greater than pa a deterioration in pm hat is greater than pa that is deliberate Yes, sir. Because of hence, increase in tariff, the implication, policy implication, is that because of the increase in tariff, PA hat can increase. PA hat can exceed PM if there is no change in tariff, and it's more. There is an increase in the world demand for food. Okay, then PA or world demand for agricultural product. So PA can hat can increase more than PM. But it depends upon what type of policy that you want to undertake for a developing economy. Okay, so okay, that's a good question. Yes, I got it. So, yes, actually, uh, uh, in that equation only, you stated out something about how uh, P A hat can become zero. Uh, can you just state out this? Yeah, yeah, P A hat can zero. You can do it on a piece of paper. That if you if if we are saying R hat greater than P M hat greater than greater than P A hat greater than W hat. You got my point? Yes, sir. So put a PA hat equal to zero. Suppose there is no change in the agricultural price, 
only yes. tariff increases so what happens in our increases of the first that's what stall plus seven percent result isn't it thank you sir sir yes uh, is not tariff directly affecting the, like uh, it's supporting the producers in the domestic market as it can eventually lead to increase in the prices in the domestic market in input yes, tariff it's also increasing the prices in the domestic market because so will we consider this as a means of protection from the government or uh, like it can even benefit the producers also protection from the government to benefit to get so that the uh, producers are benefited so government looks government just works in a manner so that the producers are benefited from it so to protect the producers to protect the domestic producers that's what that's the need for tariff protection because india followed a policy of import substitution in the early 60s 70s early 60s so actually what they followed through an increase in the tariff rate that is a means of protection so if there is an increase in the tariff rate the domestic producer gets much relief because because of the tariff rate the price of foreign products are much higher increase in the tariff rate so the domestic producers can think well we can produce more and you know that as price increases the domestic producers tariff increases domestic price so the producers can offer more because it implies less entry of the importable products of the imported products hmm. okay so the producer surplus can increase right yeah actually when under trade policy implications of tariff will be covered they will get that there are some dead weight losses as well there is a revenue from the uh, to the government as a result of tariff so there is a gain from the point of the view of the producers there is a producer surplus and there is loss of consumer surplus and there is tariff revenue and there are some two dead weight in fact there are two dead weight losses but i am not going into the analysis of tariff just an implication of tariff in the context of this model because i am applying trade theory in the context of developing economies that is the motto thank you sir is nilan to any question from youtube or somewhere else no sir okay any other question any other doubt i can make it clear paru jodi kichu bolar thake bolo you can ask me when you can ask me in bengali as well you have to go through this because it's a new thing that i've covered sir uh, what is new mere can you tell this one more new mere means that as you cannot you cannot introduce any money here because there is no money market condition so we express one commodity in terms of the just put on your microphone okay so that i can interact with you tonu ghosh yes sir hello so uh, so that uh, there is no money market condition so there are two commodities only in the economy so that one commodity is expressed in terms of other commodity see for example how much of manufacturing product can be produced what is the value of the manufacturing product you cannot say it in terms of rupees you can say it in terms of rice say rice is the other part food so you can say how much rice it requires so if you can supply 3 tons of rice i can give you one shot it appears to that of butter because there is no money here so that is the measuring lot the way we consider we consider price of manufacturing commodity in terms of price of the agricultural commodity but that's one way to bypass the whole thing because after all pa is equal to 1 so it doesn't matter ultimately it's pa so it doesn't matter even if you consider monetized dual economy the results will be same okay sir okay. anyone else okay we don't have finished on time so if there is no more question then you can stop and okay sir if any any, any question from the teachers some of the teachers are attending it any question from the teachers if there is no question then we can stop it so that's it for today tomorrow we will meet again at 4 right
Yes, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is there any question in the chat box? Okay, thank you. No, no, I don't think so. No, sir. So tomorrow we'll start at 4. I mean, sir, we'll start at 4 and we'll So we'll take entry at 3.30, isn't it? Yes, yes, we'll take entry at 3.30. Okay. Please mention that. That is important. Okay, sir. Thank okay. you, everyone. Thank you, thank sir. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.